Today, South Africans head to the polls to cast their ballot in what seems to be the most important general election since the end of the apartheid. Now, for months, public opinion polls have shown that the ruling African National Congress, ANC party, could lose its majority for the first time since Nelson Mandela led it to power in 1994. While polling can be challenging in South Africa, many experts believe that the ANC faces its tightest challenge yet with a population deeply frustrated by the country's direction. If support for the ANC drops below 50% for the first time, the party will be forced to enter into a coalition government. Well, joining me on the program to further discuss this is uh, Ayotunde Abiodun, is an analyst with uh, SBM Intelligence from Lagos, and also Matthew Pax Kosatu, that's acting national spokesperson and also parliamentary coordinator from Johannesburg. Uh, thank you for joining me, uh, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Okay, and of course, we would also be having a New Central's uh, South African correspondent joining us live from South Africa, talking about Bongani Sisiba. Uh, Bongani, if you can hear me, thank you for being on the program. Okay, I understand that Bongani will join us uh, much uh, later in the course of the program. But let me start with you, Ayotunde. Uh, today is a pivotal day in South Africa's you know, history. Some are saying that in 30 years, uh, maybe, just maybe, the ruling ANC uh, party, you know, might just not be the same Uhuru they've enjoyed in the past 30 years talking about the polls. I'd just like to know your general opinion, you know, to the build up, from the build up to the elections and then today. All right. Thank you so much for having me once again. So today's election in South Africa is a very crucial one as it touches on um, historical, political economic, social, and geopolitical dimensions. After 30 years of a lengthy rule, the African National Congress, it has ruled the country since 1994, faces its greatest challenge yet. And this has been as a result of citizens' distrust of the government over the years. There have been a lot of challenges that have really impacted um, citizens' trust in governance. We've had corruption allegations, uh, from the administration of Jacob Zuma down to our current president, Sibi Ramaphosa. We've also had economic challenges with economic inequality at the highest. According to the Gini coefficient, which measures uh, the level of in economic inequality in countries, South Africa happens to have the highest economic inequality in the whole world. These are factors that have really made today's election very significant. So the expectation is that the African National Congress will win the majority of votes, but for the first time in 30 years, they will not be able to get that 50% benchmark that will guarantee them majority at the parliament. Mm. The likely of outcomes is that they'll be forced to um, go into a coalition with other opposition parties. I mean, you said something about um, in 30 years, uh, they might not be able to garner, you know, uh, close to 50 percent, you know, of the uh, polls. I would like to know exactly why you think that is. But I'll come back to you, Ayotunde. Let me go to uh, Matthew and, of course, uh, take his opinion on the ongoing polls in South Africa. Matthew. Yes, hi. So, look, I think we're quite pleased by the turnout. Um, the elections are still happening. People have until 9 p.m. to go to the voting stations. And throughout the country, we're seeing reports of long queues. Uh, people come in a significant numbers. Um, and there also tends to be a bit of a last-minute rush, too, as many workers come back from the workplace, and they tend to also go back um, to go and vote. I've seen in the voting stations around Cape Town by lunchtime today, there was already about 50% voter turnout. So I think we're seeing many areas in KwaZulu Natal and Krauteng, big population centers, um, very long queues of voters going out. So I think we'll have to see how it goes. But there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of uh, buzz around it. But also, I think most of our voting stations are being very well run. Uh, we've seen very, very few reports of any logistics or other glitches, which tends to you know, happen now and then. But I think so far, it looks like all systems are smooth. Um, there's a big kind of hype. Uh, and I think we've seen the ANC and other political parties going all out to mobilize voters 
to the minority go out and vote. So we're expecting a quite a positive turnout. Mm. All right, let me go back to you, Ayotunde. I mean, I'm looking at uh, an SBM report here. It says uh, in your report is that for 2023, SBM predicted that for the first time in 30 years, South Africa's uh, ruling party, the ANC Congress, would win less than half of the votes. That's 50% in 2024 general polls. Now, which is the country's seventh democratic general election triggered by lower turnout than recorded in the 2019 elections. Now, Matthew is saying that the turnout is massive. And uh, according to your polls here, it says uh, it might just not be that, you know, uh, you know uh, much compared to previous years. I'd like your reaction, Ayotunde. All right. So voter turnout is a key variable in today's um, election outcome. And in the 30 years of South Africa's democratic history, and there have been a lot of key de uh, political development as a result of the challenges that brought the ruling party, the ANC. We've seen the right of, um, rise of foremost opposition parties, such as the Democratic Alliance, the uh, Economic Freedom Fighters. And these parties have started to gain significant support in urban areas and among the minority communities. So there's a lot of discontent with the ruling party, and that's why we're predicting that for the first time in 30 years, they won't be able to get the majority of votes that will secure them um, nominating the next president. All right. Now, let's uh, look at the major contenders outside the uh, ANC. We have, of course, uh, the Democratic Alliance. We have the Economic Freedom Fighters. And, uh, well, I say recently now, the MK Party, right? Uh, looking at all of these uh, major contenders, uh, what do you... Uh, think would uh, be more of a, will I say, a, a, a tight fighter, you know, with the ANC in this race? Let me start with you, Ayotunde, and then take Matthew's opinion. I didn't quite get your question, please. Okay, I, I'm saying, looking at other opposition parties, like the DA, uh, the EF, uh, EFF, that's the Economic Freedom Fighters, and, of course, uh, the recent MK Party, uh, what do you make of their involvement in this race as a major contender against the ANC? All right. Uh, from the way we see it at SBM Intelligence, we don't see any of these parties uh, winning outside majority. What we see as a possible outcome is that the ANC will win majority of the votes, but the issue is that they won't get... Um, up, they won't get up to 50%. So where these opposition parties come to play is they'll be crucial in how a coalition government will be formed as to how negotiations and concessions will play out between these parties. Mm. All right. Now, Matthew, I I'd like to know your reaction to this too. Um, in terms of the opposition, uh, I mean, we have pretty much strong contenders in this race. We have the uh, likes of the DA, we have the EFF, we also have the, of course, a recent MK party. And uh, I mean, the build up to this particular poll has shown that it's not going to be business as, as usual for the ANC. How much of a contender do you think the opposition is in this race compared to previous elections? So, no, I think it's, it's, it's a normal one. We always have opposition parties pop up for every election and then nobody tend to disappear after that. It's a bit of a strange, and I think even your headline is it's a bit unusual, saying the ruling ANC faces biggest defeat since Mandela. I haven't seen a single opinion poll in South Africa, and I check them daily, that says the ANC is not going to win the elections. I think the only issue is will the ANC get 51% or will it get in the high 40s and then have to form a coalition with a smaller party? So I've not seen one opinion poll which says the ANC is not winning the elections. Let's look at the opposition parties. So well, if the ANC at its worst gets in the mid-40s, the closest party to the ANC gets less than half the ANC support, which is the Democratic Alliance. In fact, the Democratic Alliance has been struggling. They reached a peak of about 25 27% 10 years ago, and they've been declining since that time. They've almost reached a bit of a ceiling in terms of their voter appeal. The other opposition parties actually should be quite worried. The Economic Freedom Fighters is now fighting for third place. They've been threatened with being displaced by the MK party, which is a brand new party formed a few months ago. So the EFF is actually facing, according to the opinion polls, losing support and might even lose its third place spot to the MK party. 
Um, the MK party is, is a bit difficult to predict because one, it's a brand new party. Um, it has a limited regional appeal. It looks like it might, you know, gain some support in KwaZulu Natal, where the former president um, has a bit of a, a, a narrow ethnic base that he's distinctly mobilized. Uh, but we don't see the MK party having a longing presence in South Africa's political scenario. We always have some sort of splinter group breaking from the ANC every elections. Yeah. They come with a big splash. And then about five years later, we don't see them again. So we had COPE in 2009, which got 7%. Today, prediction of COPE won't get back to Parliament. So I think for us, the only issue is the ANC must just focus on delivering. Society will rally around it, but needs to focus on dealing with corruption, growing the economy, fixing the states, dealing with crime. That's the issue. The smaller opposition parties actually never really enjoy support, like you might find other opposition parties doing in Nigeria or across the world, etc., where they rotate. Hmm. I, I mean, you, you seem to have so much faith in uh, the ANC with uh, almost outright conviction that there will be no need for coalition government in spite of the various controversies that surrounded the party and its members, you know, uh, in the build-up to the polls. I, I mean, I, I would really like to know what exactly forms the foundation or basis for your conviction or confidence. So I vote in every single South African election. This is our seventh democratic elections. ANC has won every single election, national, provincial, and local. That's a fact. One may not like it, that's fine, but it's a mathematical fact. You cannot show me one opinion poll which says ANC is not winning this election. There's not a single one. The opposition itself concedes that ANC is going to win. The only question, does the ANC get 45 or 46%, whatever it is? and have to talk to a few smaller parties to form a coalition, or does it get 51%? I think that one's a question. I don't think anybody's got the answer to that. That one looks very tight. Um, and because I think, as a colleague said um, on the show, a colleague from, from, from your, your channel, there, there's been a lot of blunders. There's been issues of corruption, of, of a slow economic growth rate, of the electricity shortages, which irritate a lot of people. And of course, this national party has run a country for three decades to have irritated some people to lose support, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I've yet to meet a single person who says the ANC is not going to win these elections. Opposition parties, which we talk to often, can see the ANC is going to win. It's just a question, does it get an outright majority or does it need to form a coalition with one or two smaller parties? But they're still going to win. Um, I think we won't win the Western Cape, which we have not won, in fact, since um, 2009 elections, uh, which is the opposition's stronghold. And then there's question marks around Gauteng and Kwasi Natal. Well, the ANC is predicted to come first in both, but I think in those ones you're going to have to have a coalition because I haven't seen any of the opinion polls giving the ANC, <laughs> apologies, um, 50% mm. those what, two problems. I mean, your association is actually the Congress of South African Trade Unions. You re, uh, your association actually does represent uh, quite a large amount of uh, the workforce in South Africa. Uh, do you think that the, the current ruling party as of now actually did represent the interest of the workers, uh, given the GDP uh, rate at the moment, the inflation level, the cost of doing business, and also the ease of doing business, and even the cost of living? Yes, it has. We have a progressive constitution achieved because of the ANC. We have a functional democracy we've achieved because of the ANC. Well, can, can you be more specific as regards policies and then maybe you you know, to initiatives? The question, or do you want to answer the question for me? Because you can't ask me the question and then you answer it. Mm. Okay. I, I can I mean, answer it's, 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 I, I need you to answer. It's up to you. Okay. If you, so please don't interrupt. That's a, it's okay, a bit of a no problem. Thing to do. So you might take lightly the fact that we're a democracy. We don't take it lightly. That of democracy was achieved because of the struggle by the ANC and Kosato. Mm. We have a progressive country today, which provides for these very elections we're having today, where a ruling party can win an election, can lose an election, but the elections, no matter what happens, will be free and fair. In the constitution, workers' rights are enshrined, including the right to strike, the right to form trade unions, rights that other African countries don't always enjoy. We have progressive labor laws that say you have paid overtime, paid leave, maternity leave, which is paid, parental leave, which is paid, a minimum wage, and so on. The right to a safe working place, that's achieved because of the ANC. We have a minimum wage since 2019, which has raised the wages of farm workers, domestic workers, about 6 million workers. So about 45% of the workforce over the past four years. Farm workers were getting as little as 600 an hour four years ago. Today it's 27.58 cents an hour. 
when COVID-19 happened, most countries did not do anything for the citizens, including African countries. Yet with the ANC and COSAT, we worked together, we released over 65 billion rand to help 5.7 million workers have money to buy food to feed their families. That's a lot. If I look at our death rates during COVID-19, it's far less than what we saw in industrialized Western countries, simply because the ANC work with the trade unions, they work with business to see how to address the issues. So for us, there's many good things. We have 27 million South Africans today, 40% of the country's population who receive financial support from the state. We have a million students at university every year who are going there free because the ANC provides free education. In every single community in our country, you have free education for those who can't afford it. We're rolling out free healthcare. So that's a lot. And those are the things that benefit working class families. It might seem peripheral, but those are major issues to our workers, to our to our voters. That's why they have confidence in there. That's why they keep voting for the ANC each time. The fact that 60% of our budget is invested in working class communities, for us, that's not a small thing. That's a big thing. And we can't blame the ANC for inflation because South Africa's inflation is about 5%. It normally averages around 4%. And it increased not because of domestic issues, it increased because of a war in Ukraine and international oil price, because we import oil. So we don't control the fluctuation of the oil price. That's the issue. So I'm not saying the ANC is perfect. No, they're not perfect. At times, as Kosovo, we've had to publicly call them to order, say, you've done wrong here, you're blundered here. But on a broad score sheet, no, they have done well for workers and they engage well, they listen to workers. If I look at the opposition parties, like the Democratic Alliance, which says they want to scrap all of our labor laws. You want to reduce workers' salaries. That's not a good story for workers. If I look at the EFF, which has got a, a real problem with the rule of law, it's got a problem with corruption, that can be a good story for workers. So for us, we know the ACE is not perfect. We're not electing the Pope, but we're electing a party which listens to workers, which is engageable, and which is, has its natural biases towards workers. All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, of course, uh, your take on this, uh, Matthew Pax. But... Right now, let's go to New Central's South African correspondent, who, of course, is in standby at the moment, Bongani Sizaba. Bongani, thank you for joining me on the conversation. Now, uh, just uh, to start off the uh, tone of uh, the conversation right now, let's, can you bring us up to speed as regards uh, the update uh, on the polls at the moment in terms of logistics, voter turnout, and if at all, uh, there, there are, you know, unusual happenings at all in your area. Okay, uh, we, of course, are trying to connect with uh, Bongani Sisiba to bring us up to speed on the polls in South Africa live. But uh, let me go to you on this one, Ayotunde. Ayotunde, I'm going back to the SBM polls here, where, of course, uh, you, in, in your ratings, uh, you talked about uh, the GDP per capita, uh, and, of course, uh, at some point uh, from 1994, uh, it was up, and then it went down till about 2002, where it, of course, spiked again, went up, and then... Uh, at some point in 2020, in 2012, it was at its highest. But since 2012, there has been a steady decline, you know, in the GDP uh, level. I, I would like to know your reaction to that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, many of the economic policies. This, of course, goes in tandem with the uh, unemployment rate that uh, your SBM uh, uh, organization actually did uh, on South Africa. But I understand, before you come back, Ayotunde, I understand Bongani is back. Bongani, uh, can you please bring us up to speed? Uh, Dapo, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, good evening, and so also good evening to our viewers. Uh, it's dark now in South Africa, 6 p.m. It's, it's always dark here, especially this time of, uh, of the year. But behind me, there is a very long queue. And like uh, in the morning when I passed through this place, there were just a few people who were here. But uh, now I've been around uh, uh, in Johannesburg, CBD. The queues are getting longer and longer. And it's now 6 p.m. It's almost 9, it will be 9 p.m. before uh, the uh, polling station closed. But the lines are very, very long. Lines are growing. I don't know, because in the afternoon lines were not like this. And most of the people who are in these queues are the youths. Like I've said, even in the afternoon, that the, number, the turnout of the youth is 
very massive, uh, unlike what we saw in 2019. Uh, and uh, the youths, most of them are saying they want change. I don't know the kind of change that they are talking about, but most of the people that I've spoken to, they are talking about change. Mm. I mean, you, you've highlighted uh, some key factors uh, in your analysis. You said the queues are long and also uh, quite a number of those on queue are young persons. You specifically use the word youths. And when you interacted with quite a few of them, you said they want change, the few you, 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 know, you interacted with. I mean, this, um, I would say, is contrary to some speculations that maybe in terms of voter behavior, we might not have seen a turnout you know, compared to what is being seen at the moment. But I, I would like you to further ex uh, you know, uh, give us more context as regards uh, the long queues. Are there enough materials in terms of logistics to attend to the people on ground? And do you anticipate a time where uh, these queues would eventually maybe cease and voting would stop? Or would it extend the official time you know, uh, for uh, the voting process? Uh, with what I'm seeing here, DAPO, not only at this polling station, but uh, two or three polling stations that have been uh, uh, at this evening, queues are very long. And uh, I would think that uh, maybe there will be an extension because also the queues are not moving as fast as they were in the afternoon, uh, maybe because uh, now they are now using a manual uh, instead of uh, what they have been using uh, in the afternoon. So uh, maybe that is why the queues are very long at, and they are moving at a very, very slow pace. Mm. You said they are using the manual alternative compared to what was being used, which I believe is automated. Why is that? I think it's because of uh, the network and also maybe it's uh, a bit slower, but uh, the network has contributed so much on this. Mm. Let's talk about security. Uh, has there been any form of security threat, violence? Uh, not that we have heard of uh, here where I am. Uh, the visibility of police. I can see police that are uh, that is around here, and people are just uh, in the queue waiting to vote. We have not had any uh, sort of violence, even uh, in the afternoon when the IEC had a media briefing. They 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 said that uh, they really appreciate uh, the citizens for voting in peace. There hasn't been any form of violence that we have had so far. Uh, everyone is voting in peace, uh, and uh, even if uh, the uh, this uh, voting will be extended. It shows that there will be peace because there is peace where I am. There is peace where I've been in the afternoon. And also uh, the IEC have confirmed that. All right. Uh, Bongani, let's also look at um, it from the angle of other polling stations. Are you aware of any polling station that has concluded voting? Not at the moment, Dapol, uh, like I said, that uh, I've been uh, going around uh, in many polling stations this evening. I've not seen any polling station that is concluded. Uh, but uh, like I said, the queues are growing longer this evening. So I doubt there is any polling station that has concluded. Maybe, maybe in the rural areas, because we know in the rural areas, they wake up very early uh, to go to vote. But here in the city, in Johannesburg, where I've been, the queues are still long. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, talking about election observers, uh, uh, you so intimated the station you, uh, that at some point that you met Nigeria's former president, good luck, Jonathan you know, there with you in South Africa. Uh, did you have any form of interaction with the former president? And if at all, uh, what was discussed? Yes, yes, I did in the afternoon. He actually recognized our mic, which is uh, something that made me so happy about. Uh, but we had a conversation where he, uh, he was speaking about how he emulates uh, the South African voting system, and he would love if Africa would also follow suit. He also spoke about how he also spoke about the security and also um, the online voting and also the diaspora voting, something that we don't see in other African countries. Uh, he also emulated uh, the commission and uh, also the police, uh, the security that he has seen around, and also the citizens for voting in peace. All right. Now, let's uh, just before I let you go, you talked about online voting and voting in diaspora. Uh, how seamless has that process been for those 
who chose to go th uh, use that option? Any any fillers? Uh, kindly repeat that double. I didn't get it. Okay, talking about the online voting and those voting in diaspora, has it been seamless for any of them? Yes, it has been. Uh, we haven't had any uh, head of any problem uh, for, for people who have been voting in diaspora. And those that are voted earlier two days ago, pregnant women, uh, those with disabilities, and uh, the old age people, they were voting uh, two days ago. We have any problems that are this and people who vote well even those in diaspora we didn't hear any problems or any complaints all right bongani is about new central's a south african correspondent uh, thank you so much for being on the program hopefully we should have you back uh maybe on the conversation but once again thank you for the update thank you Dapo. good night all right uh, well, uh, Ayotunde, I, I think I, I should uh, start off with you. I mean, that was uh, New Central's correspondent there live in South Africa, bringing us up to speed. Uh, what do you make of some of the issues uh, she raised? She talked about long queues. She talked about um, maybe due to the long queues, uh, South Africans may need to uh, stay you know, at the polls longer than they approved or the official timing. She also talked about uh, youth. Uh, being a bulk of the, uh, will I say, majority in terms of uh, trying to vote. I'd like to know your, your reaction to this, uh, Ayotunde. All right. So the state of South Africa's economy is a big factor in today's election. And why you earlier alluded to the fact that average incomes have been dropping since 2011, this has fed the narrative that the ruling party, the ANC, has been managed and mismanaged the economy. Why we also recognize that the external factors have contributed to uh, the drop in economic performance in the country, such as the coronavirus pandemic and the global price spike. However, if you factor in unemployment, which is as high as 2.9%, and youth unemployment in particular is 46%, and your reporter earlier pointed out that the youth are massively on the street to vote and they want change. And I'm sure that change is not going to be voting for the ANC today because they've been a victim of um, the brunt of the economic crisis in the country. So this high level of joblessness has been a, a big contributor to poverty and social unrest as has plagued South Africa in recent times. All right, uh, uh, thanks for that. Let, let me go to Matthews on this one. Matthew, I, I mean, you heard from our correspondent there that, uh, I mean, the young uh, generation, talking about youths, uh, make a bulk of those standing, you know, in line waiting to vote. And uh, she also echoed that some of them are screaming change. I, I would like your reaction on this. No, that'd be good news if it's correct. Um, there's always a bit of a challenge getting young, <clears throat> sorry, young people to come out and vote. Um, we often have experienced uh, lower voter registration rates for young people, low voter turn rates for young people. Um, so that's always been a bit of a worrying point for us for, for many, many years. So if, if we're seeing young people come in large numbers, then that's fantastic. That's a good sign. We hope it's so. Uh, but I think we're not the only country to, challenge, to struggle with that issue. I think you find in many countries across the world it's always difficult to get young people to, to kind of feel the need to participate in elections, um, but hopefully they do do so. Um, but I think what we do expect, you know, those predictions were for a voter turnout between 56 and 66 percent in South Africa. Um, we're expecting slightly higher than that. I think we might reach about 70 percent. Um, we would obviously love higher than that, but I think in terms of international norms, 70 percent or 66 percent is, is respectable. But ideally, we'd actually want 100% of people. Because, um, you know, ultimately, yes, we support the ANC, but ultimately we want every single South African to come out and vote. This is a democracy that must be owned by everybody if it's to be truly successful. And ultimately, we all need to have our vote. We need to vote for the political party we like. And we also need to see those political parties going to, to parliament, to the legislatures, to help participate in, in growing the economy and fixing society. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Well, at this point, we will go on a quick break. When we return, we'll be looking forward. What exactly is in store for the new government, if at all, in South Africa after the polls? Stay with us.
You're watching the conversation on New Central Television. And of course, today we are following the ongoing presidential polls in South Africa, a country that currently is at the polls voting. And uh, from what we understand, voting is still on, might, just might, extend beyond the official time because of the massive turnout. Of course, uh, this is uh, the feeling we are getting from our correspondent on ground. Uh, in person of Bongani Sinzaba. Well, I still have with me uh, my guest on the program today. Ayotunde Abiodun is an analyst from SBM Intelligence, Lagos State, and also Matthew Pak, Kosatu, acting national spokesperson uh, from South Africa. Gentlemen, thank you for hanging on. Now, let's uh, start off with uh, you, uh, you know, at the second, uh, you know, half of the program, Ayotunde. Um, South Africa right now is a country that has, just like many other African countries, you know, economic issues, there's the standard of living, there's the cost of living, there's also inflation, you know, aside many other issues that um, uh, the country is facing at the moment. What do you think uh, the government that is eventually voted into power stands to face and should address or brace up for, you know, when they eventually get into office? All right. Um, thank you for your question. You already highlighted the challenges that the country currently faces. Um, already, the new administration has its work cut out for it to do. But to buttress the work we do at SBM Intelligence, I will focus on the geopolitical implications of this election outcome. Uh, so, starting out with the regional dynamics, South Africa is a big force within the Southern African Development Community. And so this election outcome will significantly impact regional stability and leadership. As such, because we see that South Africa has been a key destination for migrants within that region. So the outcome of this election will really shape stability in within that region. Um, also on the international stage, uh, the Outcome of the election will impact the country's relations with major powerhouses like um, China, Russia, the US, and also the European Union. And also on the backdrop of the country's involvement in the Israel-Palestine conflict by taking Israel uh, before the International Court of Justice. All of these issues have geopolitical implications. And the next administration needs to be strategic and diplomatic as to how it goes to handle these issues, um, especially in terms with the country's relation with the United States. And we see that the United States is not happy with the country's involvement with China and Russia. And we've seen that on two occasions, the United States have attempted to punish South Africa for some of the most stress we saw in June last year, where a group of lawmakers in the US Ask the Biden administration to uh, relocate the um, African Growth and Opportunity Act program that was scheduled to hold in Johannesburg in November last year. They asked the Biden to shift the location elsewhere and maybe to punish the country because of its involvement with Russia and China. These are the kind of issues that the next administration must um, try to be strategic and diplomatic about. Also, if you consider the recent uh, South African involvement in the Israel-Palestine um, war. This has also triggered dissent between the United States, um, claiming that South Africa's um, suit against Israel is politically motivated. And as such, this has a long-term impact that could negatively impact uh, South Africa domestically. And also in terms of its relation with the European Union, um, so the European Union is a key trade partner to South Africa, and recently the EU passed the carbon um, levy charge. Uh, the South African government has raised reservations against the charge, and they even threatened to take um, the EU before the WTO forum for dispute settlement. All of these issues have geopolitical implications for the next administration. So. The next administration must prioritize strategic diplomatic engagement with these um, stakeholders. All right. Uh, thank you, Ayotunde. Well, let me invite uh, Brian Pugjeni, is a journalist from Johannesburg, South Africa, to the conversation right now. Brian, 
Uh, thank you for joining me on the program. Um, thank you for having me. All right, great. I understand that you have been, uh, of course, on ground following uh, the unveiling of, in, of events, you know, in, uh, at the polls. Do you, would you like to bring us up to speed as regards what you know, what you've observed, and uh, what you think, uh, uh, sh you know, should be spoken about? Well, thank you. Yeah, we've, I've been on the ground since in the morning, early hours of the morning, from around 7 a.m. until late evening. Um, the polls were very full in most places in the morning because most people wanted to vote as early as possible and then have the rest of the day to relax because it was a public holiday. So, but there are some stations where in the afternoon um, there were still um, quite some queues because of a few minor issues with the ballots, um, having less ballots in some areas. But in some areas, there are quite a number of ballots and the lines were very mo were moving quite quite fast and people were in and out in no time and they were happy and um, jovial about the situation saying they came there to vote as early as possible. They got there, they did what they wanted to do and they, they left so that they can have the rest of the day to, to themselves. But in some areas, of course, like in the townships because um, service delivery is different um, clearly in, uh, in both situations, uh, what people are voting for at the moment because people are voting for change at the moment. Some in the township saying that uh, they need change in service delivery. So the polling stations showing that service delivery is also different in different areas, because in the townships it was quite slow, but in the northern suburbs, um, service was quite, was quite fast and people were, were quite happy about the service. Mm. Well, you, you said quite a, a number of things, that s some of which seem to you know, corroborate what our correspondent on ground also said. You, you talked about large turnout and that the narrative seems to revolve around change. Would you like to elaborate more on that? Well, obviously, um, there's uh, different sentiments around in every area. Um, some people are obviously saying that they need change in the country. Um, with most people disappointed in the ruling party with the ANC, saying that the ANC has failed to deliver in most um, parts of service delivery. Um, like now people are even talking about load shedding, saying that load shedding will be back straight after the elections. That shows that people are not really sure about what the ruling party has been doing. Uh, so some are saying they really need some change. So um, some are looking at different opposition parties to say maybe these opposition parties will offer what they are looking for. But obviously, your vote is a secret. People won't really say who they are really voting for. But the sentiment on the ground, especially with new young voters, who people really hope that will bring about the change, it does have that sentiment of saying um, in the next uh, with these elections, the young voters are going to bring about that change in South Africa, and the young voters are going to vote out the ruling party. But we'll, we'll wait to see in the next couple of days as the election uh, results start to trickle in. Um, so that's what we're waiting for. But at the moment, uh, most polling stations are quiet. Obviously, there are a few people who are working, like us journalists, who, who've been out there uh, or are going out there to, to cast our votes today, those who couldn't cast their special votes um, yesterday. Hmm. Well, let's talk about the security situation too on ground. What did you observe? Uh, well, in most places um, in Johannesburg, where I am, it was very quiet and um, and and good. Most, most there was no incidents, no violence, um, no issues of um, ballot boxes being tampered with. Um, the only thing, like I mentioned earlier, was just a few polling stations where uh, there were a few polling uh, ballot boxes. And obviously, the, which resulted in queues being 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 longer. But we did hear of incidents in some places, like in KZN uh, and in the Eastern Cape. But around Johannesburg, it's been quiet. Um, even Minister Begikel is saying that um, things have been smooth around the city and around the province. Mm. All right, uh, Brian, I might just leave you for a moment. I'd like to go to Matthew right now. Matthew, uh, please feel free to react to any of uh, the things Brian has said. But my question to you is this, how important is this election for COSATU, particularly the working or trading population in South Africa? What, what do you think, how much of an impact do you think this, uh, the new, this would have on the new administration? No, look, elections are important to any country. Um, you know, obviously, it's the when you choose your, your government. But I think, you know, as all the colleagues have said, we have real difficult challenges as a country. Um, there have been real significant blunders 
<clears throat> in the previous uh, decade, you know, around corruption and the impact that's have had on the ability of the state to provide critical public services, the impact that's had on the economy and unemployment and so forth. So there are real consequences. We also have some political parties who are deeply embedded in corruption, um, have, a, have a very unhealthy relationship with the rule of law. So there are real consequences. And unfortunately, elections also tend to be a little bit polarizing at times. We tend to retreat to our corners, our comfort zones. We tend to demonize other political views in society. And that doesn't help because at the end of the day, um, when you go to the parliament, you're going to have, like in the current parliament, you have about 13 political parties. Obviously, the ANC is the majority party, but you still have other parties too. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, we, we all live in the same country. We all have to find a way to work together. So I think for us, it's critical. We, we, we want to see the ANC having a majority government. Uh, yes, because they're our ally. We, the policies you know, favor workers. But also, we don't want to see a coalition scenario like we have in Gauteng province or some other of the cities where you don't have a majority party. What you've seen there is very inst unstable. Um, you had like in Nelson Mandela Bay, which is a, what used to be called Port Elizabeth, um, a key industrial city on the co East Coast. I think about eight mayors over the past five years or so. And that's had an impact on the issue of the, the municipality to deliver basic services like water, etc. In Johannesburg, we have a real issue of crime and cleanliness and so forth and decay in some areas. <clears throat> They've had about five mayors or so. So we don't want to see that kind of chaos at a national level, definitely. Um, so we do hope for a stable majority result for the ANC nationally. We also want to see stable results for provincial government too, because they also play an important role in delivering education, health, transport, roads, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, but I think we also want to see that a very firm mandate is given to President Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, because he's made he's managed to kind of secure some important turnarounds on many fronts. We've seen tax collection improving, when it had been declining because of corruption. We've seen that the law enforcement agencies are beginning to, to fill critical positions, positions sorry, and to take people, senior people, including politicians, to court for corruption. We're beginning to see some uh, positive news on the economic front too, increasing investments. We've seen real progress in, on the electricity front um, over the past year, where we've had you know, gone from 12 hours of load shedding a day. We haven't had it for the past two months. So there's, there's positive momentum. We don't want to see it being disrupted uh, because that's important to workers. And I think we want to see how do we accelerate that. Um, so I think for us, there's a lot of working on it, about growing the economy, reducing unemployment and poverty, and about tackling crime and corruption. All right. Uh, let me go to you, Brian, on this one. You talked about long queues. Are there chances where uh, the elections might exceed, at least from the areas you observed uh, poll uh, uh, voting going on? Are there chances that elections might succeed, exceed the official time? And are there polling stations that, you know, have concluded voting? Well, obviously, there are some people, like I was saying earlier, that who are going to leave at maybe at this time to say, I'm going to vote because the polling stations are closing at 9 p.m. South African time. So, but the IEC did say that if you're at the polling station at 9 p.m. and they are queues, they, uh, they will still allow you to vote. But there will be very few of those polling stations which will witness such such things because most people uh, did go during the day to just go and get it over and done with. So, but the few ones which I saw, which had a few queues, um, they were really um, finishing by late um, afternoon, early evening. So, not many of those polling stations will have that issue, um, especially here where I was in Johannesburg North. All right, let's also uh, look at, um, I'm still with you, Brian. Let's also consider, you talked about the age bracket of those on polls. You, said, you used the word young people. You said that quite a number of them are enthusiastic to come out to vote and uh, even echoing change. How much of an impact do you think the involvement will have on this polls based on your observation? Um, based on my observation and what um, everyone has been crying about, because we've had a problem with young people in South Africa not registering to vote, not turning up to vote. But I think this um, election, there was about almost a million or just over a million of young people who uh, were new voters who registered to vote. So a lot of people are happy about that. And these young people are the ones who've been complaining about service delivery, especially students and young people who are unemployed who are saying um, they need 
to to get that change of saying um, that the ANC, the ruling party, has been in power and nothing has been changing, especially for young people. So we're um, everyone is happy that young people did turn up, though the turn up is not what everyone expected because there are a lot of places where I also went to where young people were like, even if I do go and vote, there won't be any change. So the sentiment is still the same, but it's better than the last election where um, there were very few young people who did turn up to vote. But this time it's positive and hopefully the ones who did turn up will encourage the other young people to also do turn up for the next local government elections and the next um, national elections as well. All right, uh, let me go to you, Ayotunde, on this one. Um, a recent ranking of South Africa in terms of security, according to the World Economic Forum, safety ratings placed South African cities at uh, 29th position out of 32. Now, my question is this. How much of a concern should security in South Africa be uh, for the new government? It's a big concern for the new government. It is. Um, we need to understand that the country's economic condition has also been a big driver for the insecurity that South Africa is currently battling with uh, as such. So we also need to factor the fact that the South African police service is losing this war on crime. And this is from a perspective of manpower. Currently, there are about 850,000 um, police officers to cater for the country's 62 million population. And this narrative has given room for South Africa to emerge as one of the largest security industries in the world, as public data show that there are more than 2.7 million registered private security officers in the country. And currently, there are about at least 580,000 of these officers active. And this just shows that uh, citizens do not have trust in the public security system, but that they will opt for private security arrangements to secure them. And it also shows that poor South Africans who do not have the resources to platinize these private security agencies are less vulnerable. So security is a big, big, big concern for the next administration to solve. We also need to understand the migration dynamics to this current situation. Uh, so currently, we have about 2.4 million people, which makes up about 3% of South Africa's population who are migrants, uh, immigrants in South Africa. And in spite of how the economic challenges have persisted over the years, South Africa has still remained attractive to immigrants. But we also need to point out that there's been an increase in the wave of xenophobic violence as um, immigrants are being targeted. And just earlier this month, the Human Rights Watch had to raise the alarm that immigrants were being scapegoated and demonized in the election campaign. And there was a big risk of xenophobic violence against a set of people. So this all paints the narrative that security is a big concern for the next administration saw. Mm. And the most also factor in that the most comprehensive of police reforms will not solve this problem are devoted to the economic inequality that split South Africa in recent years. We must solve the economic problem first before they can see impact in terms of security. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Now, let me just take, uh, of course, uh, Brian, your uh, final comments, uh, 30 seconds. Um, well, it's going to be interesting the next couple of days when the results start trickling in, um, which obviously I'm sure we are going to talk about it. Um, but I'm sure as of Friday, we're, start, we're going to start seeing those results coming in. And they'll be very interesting to see whether this change is going to come about or the NC is going to sneak through. All right. How about uh, yours too, Matthew? Your final comments, 30 seconds. Yeah, look, I think it's a positive thing. We're having a seven democratic elections. Um, it is slightly noisy. We're, we're quite a noisy democracy. Uh, but I think we're, we'll be better for it. Um, the elections will come and go. We'll have to work together the day after, irrespective of whichever results happen. And I think we have just, we all know what we need to do to grow the economy, to reduce unemployment, to reduce poverty, to deal with climate corruption. I think on most issues, there is consensus. We just have to make sure we actually action it 
and we do so fast. Um, we have all the potential in the world, the infrastructure, the resources, the capacity. We just need to do much more, much faster. All right. Thank you so much for your time on the program, gentlemen. Ayotunde Abiodun, an analyst from SBM Intelligence from Lagos, Nigeria. Matthew Parks, Kosatu, acting national spokesperson and also a brand. Thank you so much, a journalist from South Africa. Thank you so much, gentlemen, once again for your contribution on the program today. And all the best to South Africa and South Africans. And of course, uh, that's a wrap on the show today. But before we go, I think I should just drop uh, a few words uh, concerning or pattern words, just on a personal note. Coincidentally, today also happens to be Nigeria's Democracy Day. Nigeria is also marking uh, the new administration's first year in office. But ironically, Nigerians woke up to a surprise, a change in our national anthem. I won't call it a change, but it's actually a change because... Uh, the anthem that was uh, sort of reintroduced was an old anthem handed over by the country's former colonial masters. I mean, it was replaced with an anthem that was actually composed by a Nigerian. And of course, that brings the question. I mean, when we listen to uh, the houses, you know, talking about the refs and, of course, the National Assembly debate and talk on this issue, they were thanking the president for bringing back fond memories. In other words, nostalgia. And the big question is this. What is the priority of the administration? An administration that the president said he would not address the people on his first year in office. Maybe apparently because there's nothing to talk about. But is this the way to go? Is this what Nigerians really want? An anthem that many consider maybe even outdated, right? Sometimes it beckons the question at all. What exactly is important to these people? Leadership. Leadership is about responsibility. It's not about personal interest. I think African leaders really need to understand this. Let me stop here. In case you missed the program, you can actually catch up on our YouTube page. The handle is at New Central TV. The opinions of our guests remain theirs and not that of New Central. My name is Dakwa Adeboye. Bye for now. <laughs>